Hello again, my name is Tom Irvine, and I'm the instructor for this Shock and Vibration webinar series. And I again thank Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, for their support of this webinar series. Well, we've been talking about mechanical shock, and more particularly, in the last unit, we introduced pyrotechnic shock. And we're going, to, we're going to continue on today with pyrotechnic shock, or you might just say pyroshock. And we actually have uh, two topics um, that we're going to be considering. The first is aliasing, and the second is spurious trend removal. And th these two topics are somewhat related in that they both address uh, different types of errors that can occur when we measure mechanical shock data. And this is more a particular problem uh, for the case of near-field uh, pyrotechnic shock measurement. We've talked about uh, the need for analog anti-aliasing filters in a previous webinar unit. And it's very critical that they be used for shock measurements. Uh, among other reasons is that, uh, uh, particularly for pyrotechnic shock, we just simply do not know what the maximum source energy that will be present in the data, or in the event, I should say. And because we're ignorant, and, and because this high ultra-high frequency energy uh, is simply unknown, uh, we need to uh, protect our data, our lower frequency data, by passing that data through an analog anti-aliasing filter prior to digitization. And if anti-aliasing filters are not used, there is a possibility that our shock response spectrum plots could have errors up to 20 dB, uh, which is quite, quite a high error. Now, in order to get that 20 dB error to occur, though, the, the source event must have a massive amount of ultra-high frequency energy. And that might seem rather hypothetical, but it actually can occur, especially for uh, near-field measurements of linear shape charge or, or explosive bolts or other type of charges. And this actually can happen in uh, laboratory uh, settings. So here's a, a typical uh, laboratory setup for high amplitude, high frequency, mechanical shock. And this would be maybe used when the SRS uh, level, so maybe maybe if the spec specification has a plateau, that plateau level is above, say, 10,000 SRS Gs. And in this case, a typical test setup would be to take the unit under test or avionics box, whatever it might be, and to mount it on one side of a plate or maybe to a shelf attached to that plate. And then on the other side of the plate, is to take some detonation cord. Now this detonation cord, just in this image, if you just look at it, it kind of looks like that uh, uh, yellow utility rope, uh, nylon utility rope that you might uh, purchase at a hardware store. But in this case, what it is, it's, a, it's called a textile explosive cord. And in this particular case, it has a load of 50 grains per foot of PETN explosive. And largely through trial and error, rather than through calculation, uh, the test conductor has to determine what length of cord should be used and how that should be attached uh, to, to the plate. Uh, in, in other words, should, should the explosive cord be coiled up, or should it be kind of uh, put in like a, like a snake-like pattern? Uh, and, and that's really kind of a, just a black art. There's, there's no uh, governing differential equation for that. Well, the, the concern is that in some cases up to 50 feet of this detonation cord might be used. And again, and again you know, the, the maximum frequency energy that that uh, detonation cord puts out, that, that's simply an unknown. We don't have the instrumentation, the right instrumentation and high enough sample rates and uh, to, to, to actually even measure that. And, and, and really, the SRS specifications typically just go up to about 10,000 hertz anyway. So, so, so beyond that, we, 
we don't know, and to some extent we don't care. But you know, because because we're ignorant of what kind of uh, high frequency energy, ultra high frequency energy might be present, it is very important to have a analog anti-aliasing filter for that accelerometer data. Uh, another s side note, this is something that I kind of, a little bit of a soapbox type comment, is that say an avionics box is to be mounted on a launch vehicle and it's 12 feet away from the, from the separation plane. Well, at 12 feet away, that could well be what we call a far field. Uh, situation where the response is dominated by structural modes. It, it depends on what, on the material and joints and a few other parameters. Well, so let's say we've done a ground test and, we, and we've measured the, the shock at a particular mounting point uh, in, in the far field, say 12 feet away. And the first thing we're going to do is make a conservative envelope. We're going to probably take whatever that SRS was and just draw a, a ramp and maybe a plateau that envelops it. Well, then someone's going to come along and say, well, this was just one data point from one test, so we have to add a statistical uncertainty factor to that. So then we might add 3 dB or 4.5 dB, whatever. And then we might say, well, this one accelerometer data needs to cover a, an entire zone in this far field. So I suppose we could add on a spatial uncertainty fact, factor as well. And, and so we get our maximum predicted environment level, or sometimes it's called a maximum expected flight level, whichever. And, and then someone else comes along and say, well, but to make that into qualification test level, we have to add 3 dB or 6 dB. So, so then we add some more margin on. And then someone else says, well, some of these components in that zone are the range safety flight termination components. So range, the range is, is, is having us add on another 3 dB. So we have a dozen or so dB added on to this one measured data point. And what that effectively causes us to do is to take that avionics box that's mounted in the far field and test it in a near field uh, configuration as shown in this image. Well, as it turned out, uh, th there's been a problem in the test industry um, with certain labs, and one in particular that I won't mention, uh, did shock testing for many years without using any type of analog anti-aliasing filter. And, and here's a little subtle riddle, and I don't expect that you, you to understand this the first time through, because I'm going to show you some plots later on that will make it a little easier. But there was a test lab uh, that performed a shock test with a, a certain sample rate. And one of their customers asked the test conductor to increase the sample rate. Well, the conductor said, oh, no, then we would have to increase the length of the detonation cord. In other words, have to increase the length of the detonation cord so that the resulting accelerometer data came within specification of the SRS spec. Well, that, that does not make sense at all. <laughs> that third, third bullet there, is that's just crazy talk, although it's also case history. Well, the, the explanation of all this is that the increasing the sample rate gives more accurate results. Now, when we're collecting data, it's always good to have a very high sample rate, more than we think we need. And, and increasing the sample rate does, in fact, give us more accurate measurements. but of course, there's also a potential diminishing returns effect as well. So we don't have to have some insanely high uh, sample rate. And, and, and the anti-aliasing filter helps us to justify uh, using a lower sample rate. But the lab in question did not use an, an, analog anti-aliasing filters. So the accelerometers were picking up this high frequency energy and after that data was digitized, that high frequency energy was reflected down to lower frequencies. And the SRS appeared to be within the specified tolerances, so the plots looked good and everyone was happy. But in reality, the component was being under-tested. And unfortunately, this error affected many components which had been tested for many customers over a period of many years. And it created a huge... Uh, 
uh, stir in the uh, testing community. Well, what I'm, what I'm going to do next is, is go through a numerical experiment. Now, this is going to be a numerical experiment using digital data to, to somewhat simulate the type of problem that happened and, and also to help you understand uh, this better. And, and of course, the, the, the bottom line of all this is, is quite simple. It's, you must use an analog <laughs> anti-aliasing filter. So let's, let's start off with a hypothetical specification. Now, th this is not representative of real specifications because the final breakpoint is 250 kilohertz. Well, typically for a pyrotechnic SRS type shock test, the spec would go from 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz. That's the convention. But just for educational and demonstration points, reasons, I'm taking that final breakpoint at 250 kilohertz. And this particular shock has a ramp and then a plateau. So the next thing we're going to do is synthesize a time history using damp sinusoids to satisfy that SRS spec. And actually in the webinar uh, unit that I'm going to record one week from now, which will be the next one, we're going to learn how to do synthesis ourselves. But anyways, that blue curve there at the top, that's an acceleration time history. It's synthesized to satisfy the SRS spec in table one. And it's sampled at 2.5 megahertz. Well, as you recall, the final breakpoint in the table one was at 250 kilohertz. So this is 10 times higher. And the waveform is carefully controlled so that there are no uh, energy components above 250 kilohertz. So we're going to say that this blue curve, that's the true data. It represents the true analog data with no aliasing error. Okay, now the bottom curve, the red curve here, is equal to that blue curve except we've decimated it by a factor of 32 with no low pass filtering. So another word for that blue curve, we've taken every 30 second point and plotted it and we've discarded all the other points. So the bottom curve is effectively sampled at 78.125 kilohertz. And this potentially has aliasing. Now, if you look at these two signals, this blue curve here has a peak of about a little over 600 Gs, whereas this red curve here, uh, its peak is just a little above 500 Gs. So you can already see that there's a little bit of, you might call that peak clipping effects going on. And also we're concerned that uh, with this red curve that there could be aliasing. And the reason there's aliasing is because, the potential for aliasing is because the shock energy goes out to 250 kilohertz. But this data is sampled at less than that, at 78.125 kilohertz. Okay, now if we take it, a close-up view, and this is from 0 to 800 microseconds. And the blue curve is the original data. We're calling this the true data that uh, truly represents the event, accurate data with no aliasing. Now the red curve is the decimated data. And decimation itself is kind of analogous to low-pass filtering, S somewhat, but you got to be a little bit careful with that. But you can see that, at least for this case, that the red curve smooths out the blue curve. And that, and that again, was uh, accomplished via the downsampling or decimation. Now, let's take an SRS of both of those curves. So uh, the title of this is SRS, Q is equal to 10. You've got peak acceleration in G versus natural frequency in hertz. And the original data, this is the, the so-called true data that was sampled at 2.5 megahertz. Okay, the blue curve is that uh, SRS. And then the red curve is the decimated curve. And since it's at a much lower sample rate, uh, it can only go out to, in this case, the red curve goes out to about 10,000 hertz. Whereas our blue curve goes up to just a little bit above its uh, well, it, it goes up to about uh, 250 or so uh, kilohertz, which was the maximum uh, energy present. A actually, 
it, it goes up to slightly above uh, 300 kilohertz. But anyways, just looking at the blue curves and red curves, they're, they're pretty similar uh, over most of the frequency spectrum, up to 10,000 hertz. And by the time we do our plus and minus 3 dB tolerance bands, or, or maybe we're using plus and minus 6 dB tolerance bands, uh, about, 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 the blue, about the nominal level, we, we would say, well, there's not really a problem. Uh, you know, this is okay for a test situation. So th there's no real reason to jump up, up, jump up and down and get excited. Everything's good so far. Well, let's, let's change this a bit. Let's say that uh, for this specification that uh, at the 250 kilohertz frequency, we now have 50,000 Gs. So we've, we've uh, tremendously increased the acceleration at 250 kilohertz. And, and we've done this to simulate what could hypothetically happen in a near-field pyrotechnic shock uh, situation. Now, how well does this actually represent a near-field shock, pyrotechnic shock uh, separation type event or detonation? Well, I've, I've never had the instrumentation to measure up to that frequency and up to that level, so I can't say for sure, but uh, let, let's just go with this and see what happens. We're, we're going to pretend. And so through our pretended example, we, we synthesize again a, a time history at 2.5 megahertz. That's the top curve, the blue one. And we're assuming that that's the accurate representation of that uh, source shock event in the near field. The bottom curve we're simulating aliasing by downsampling or decimating by a factor of 32. And now, un unfortunately, I made these two curves with different uh, uh, y limits. But you can see this blue curve here goes up to maybe about uh, 13,000 Gs, where this decimated curve is less than 10,000 Gs. So RA, you can see there's sort of a, a peak clipping effect going on, which uh, could be a concern. But let's see what happens when we zoom in. So we're, we're going to zoom, zoom in. Uh, in this case, it's to be up to 400 microseconds. And we've got an acceleration time history. The blue curve is the, or we're calling it the true data with no aliasing. The red curve is our decimated data. And, and what's happening now is that it's it's no longer so much that the that the red curve is smoothing out the blue curve. It's it's more it's just sort of jumping around, and it looks like there's a potential that this red curve has introduced some low frequency distortion. So that's what we have to sort of watch out for, and let's see what happens when we take a shock response spectrum of each curve. So we have a plot here: SRS Q is equal to 10. The y-axis is peak acceleration in G. The x-axis is natural frequency in hertz. The blue curve is the one which um, meets the specification. Now, this red curve here is our decimated curve. And do you remember we talked about the potential for low frequency distortion? Well, that's what happens. And an another way of saying this is that some of that high frequency energy gets reflected down about the Nyquist frequency and deposited at the low frequencies in a very bogus or spurious manner. And as we go along the different natural frequencies up to 10,000 hertz, the error varies by 10 to 20 dB. So that's a very serious error. And the blue curve is the accurate one. And the red curve is the inaccurate one because it has aliasing errors. And this, in sort of a very simplistic way, is kind of sort of what happened in one of the major test labs where, where they were getting plots. In, in other words, th th without using aliasing, anti-aliasing filters, uh, just by way of this example, the test lab was coming up with these red curves that were within spec. But in reality, the data was down at the blue curve level. So components were being under-tested by 10 to 20 dB. And that caused a lot of consternation and, uh, and, 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 and different people, different engineers had to go back and, 
revisit how they derive the test levels in the first place, hopefully uh, being able to show that they were overly conservative, conservative and that they could take out margins so they did not need to go and retest all their components. But it was, it was really a, you know, th this is going back about 10 years or so. It was, it was, it was a huge issue. Okay. Now that uh, concludes the first part of our webinar today. Now we're going to talk about another error source. So aside from aliasing, there are other things that can affect the quality of our accelerometer data. And this is more particular for near-field pyrotechnic shock. But we need to, to be aware of this for regardless of where, what type of field and what type of device we have. Uh, and, and this type of spurious trend includes baseline shifts or zero shifts, uh, spurious low-frequency trends of, of all sorts. And there was a, an engineer by the name of Anthony Chu, and he no, noted that the zero shift can be of either polarity and of unpredictable amplitude and duration. And he identified six potential uh, causes of zero shift. And this is more particularly for piezoelectric accelerometers. Overstressing of the sensing element, physical movement of the sensor parts, cable noise, base strain induced errors, inadequate low frequency response, and overloading of signal conditioner. And one of the things to keep in mind is that it is very difficult to accurately measure high frequency, high amplitude energy while simultaneously measuring low amplitude low frequency energy. That's just tough to do. And in fact, in many cases, our SRS specs for pyroshock <clears throat> begin at 100 hertz because we just sort of throw up our hands and say, well, what's below 100 hertz is uh, questionable anyways. Now, there's a particular type of, of uh, error source that uh, actually combines a couple of, of uh, uh, points from that previous list. And this is where the accelerometer's own natural frequency is excited. And this is particularly a problem if it's a piezoelectric crystal uh, accelerometer, although it can happen for other sensors as well, other sensor types as well. And, and this piezoelectric accelerometer may have its amplification factor of Q greater than or equal to 30 at resonance. So this resonance, it, it can it can be excited by this high frequency source energy and that creates a spurious output. Uh, and, 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 and some of the, the effects of that spurious output actually show up at the lower frequencies. We'll talk more about that here shortly. And uh, Chu noted a few other points I'll mention uh, that, that when this, uh, this crystal resonance gets excited, that can cause problems for the signal conditioner. Right? to be overloaded. So when a signal conditioner attempts to process this signal, one of its stages is driven in, into saturation. Now I, I kind of use that term saturation loosely. Uh, I, I tend to be a little careless, I guess, or kind of generalize and say any, any type of offset or baseline shift in my accelerometer data, I'm just going to call that saturation. Uh, but, but I guess a more particular uh, circumspect definition is, uh, is that the signal conditioner stage, one, stage or one of the stages is driven into saturation. Uh, not only does this clipping distort the in-band signals momentarily, but the overload can partially discharge capacitors in the amplifier, causing a long time constant transient. And, and that's what shows up as kind of the low frequency error in the shock data. And, and, and it could cause zero shift or some spurious low frequency trend. Okay. Now there's a, a couple of things that we do to try and uh, uh, judge the valid validity or quality of our accelerometer data. We expect our acceleration time history to oscillate somewhat symmetrically about the zero baseline. And then as we integrate that signal to velocity, we also expect the velocity to oscillate about the zero baseline, or, or, or at the very least have a, a net zero velocity. Uh, the positive and negative SRS curves should be similar, and l l let's just say within 3 dB at all natural frequencies. 
And then the SRS positive and negative curves should each have initial slopes from about 6 to 12 dB per octave. Now, now, now having said this, there, there are some uh, special cases that you might come across, but uh, say for about 95% of what you would measure, uh, th these, these are good guidelines for, for, for judging your data. And, and otherwise, editing is, is needed. And, and I, I should say also that, that uh, editing can also be required for other reasons as well. And I think at some point we're going to talk about electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic pulse spikes that can show up in the data. And sometimes those, that, those uh, spikes have to be edited out manually. <laughs> OK, and I think I have another slide. Where's my slide of the, did we skip over a slide? Well, the point is sometimes we need to do data surgery. And I thought I had a, a picture of a, of a search, and maybe that's coming up. OK, now last week we talked about uh, an RV separation event. And we said, OK, here's this flight accelerometer data. And we learned, learned about pyrotechnic shock using that pulse. We did an SRS. And, and actually, what we looked at previous was not the raw data. It was actually the cleaned up data. And this is what the raw data looks like. So today we're, we're going to sort of back up and go to what the raw data was from that accelerometer measurement. And the raw data has a shift, a baseline shift, of about minus 100 G. And that is a, at least a yellow flag and probably a red flag. I'll, I'll, I'll say it's really kind of a red flag, because uh, certainly we do not expect that RV, this was an RV separation <laughs> event, to undergo 100 G of rigid body acceleration. So we have to clean that up. Now, if we integrate to velocity, then we get this huge, we call this sometimes a ski slope effect. So th there is no way that th at the end of the event, the, uh, the velocity was minus uh, uh, 3,000 inches per second. And, 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 and again, we're talking about the dynamic uh, velocity as opposed to, the, as to what, the, what, the, what the CG velocity, or rigid body velocity is. Now, when we take an SRS of that, uh, the raw data, so we have acceleration SRS, Q is equal to 10. And along the y-axis, we have peak acceleration G. Along the x, natural frequency in hertz. Now, in this case, the green curve is the negative, And the blue curve is the positive. Well, the SRS came up with some actually some zero amplitudes for the peak positive response below about 150 hertz. And since this is a log-log plot, the, the MATLAB software was unable to plot those zero amplitude points. So those were just uh, truncated or cut out from, or deleted from the plot. So that's why you see this, this blue, blue curve. It's just falling off, and then it just stops. Well, there's several warning signs here. Uh, one is we expect the slopes for each of the two curves to be somewhere between 6 dB per octave to 12 dB per octave. And that doesn't happen. Here we have almost just a flat plateau. And here we have a very high drop off. So that, that's a clear warning sign. Now, now the curves also tend to diverge somewhere below 800 hertz. And, we, and above 800 hertz, you can see those positive and negative curves are very similar. Below 800 hertz, they start to diverge. And, and the divergence of those two curves is a warning sign. OK, here's my surgeon picture. So some people would say, oh, we have to throw out that previous data. It's bad data. It's no good. Throw it out. Well, that data is precious. It's, it's gold to us. And we want to save that data because it's the only data we got. So we're going to do everything we can to, to save that data. Now, when we talk about saturation effect removal or spurious trend removal, there is no one right way to do that. <laughs> but again, data is precious, so we, we want we want to re re recover the what we, our best engineering estimate of what the true data is, and, and our goal is to obtain. And I've underlined the word a plausible 
we want to come up with a plausible estimate of the, of the raw acceleration, excuse me, of the, of the, the true acceleration time history in its SRS. So what, I, what I'm going to say here, this is my own propaganda, you know, for, to take it for whatever it's worth, is that regardless of whatever trend removal method you use, please document that and, and show your data before and after uh, your, your cleanup process. And again, is how to how to do that cleanup process. There is no one right way. Uh, it, it almost becomes, in some cases, you have to just go by channel by channel, and and sometimes even use different methods on different channels. But there are different methods like polynomial trend removal, various types of high pass filtering, and I think as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there could be electromagnetic interference or electromagnetic pulse spikes that have to be manually edited out. And, and these could happen, for example, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a cable with delivering current to the initiator for, the, for that pyrotechnic charge. And, and if that cable is running maybe parallel with the uh, accelerometer cable or if the accelerometer cable doesn't have the proper shielding, whatever, there could be some interference that uh, could show up in that accelerometer data. And one thing we do, we, we, we can do this in ground test, but not in flight, is that during a ground test, we'll, we'll have one accelerometer that will just be suspended freely from some bracket or stand or something. So we have this accelerometer, it's just sus suspended in air, and it's not attached to any mechanical structure, and we can use the data from that accelerometer, which should be just zero amplitude, but if there's any ground loop effects or electromagnetic pulse effects that show up in that accelerometer, uh, that's an important piece of data because that can guide us in terms of uh, removing similar effects from the other accelerometer uh, channels. Well, one of the points I want to make the last bullet is I am just not a fan of turning the crank methods for doing this. I think each each data record is, is unique and, and, and deserves its own tender, loving care. And if, if you've done a massive test where you have 100 different channels, then, then yes, you have to spend time going through those signals, you know, one by one to do this. That, that's, just my, that's just my opinion, you know, for whatever it's worth. Okay, now the method that we're going to, I'm going to demonstrate, which is, again, this is only one of several potential methods, but I think it's a pretty good one for general purposes. We're going to do something called a mean filter. Now, a mean filter is its a simple sliding window filter that replaces the center value in the window with the average or mean value of all the values in the window. And it's, it's actually quite a simple concept. And what this does is it it, it smooths out the data, so it's really a low-pass filter of the data. But then if we take this mean filter, low-pass filter data, and we subtract it from the raw data, then indirectly we've high-pass filtered our data. So again, that's taking our raw data, subtract the mean filter data. That gives us our indirectly high-pass filter data. And that's actually quite useful for cleaning up uh, pyrotechnic shock. And just as an aside here, if you do a Google search on mean filtering, about 95% of the links will be to, to mean filtering for optical images. Uh, that the people that process optical images love to use mean filters uh, to smooth out those images. But mean filtering can also be used on digitized time histories. So let's go ahead and do a MATLAB exercise where we're going to apply this sort of indirect mean filtering to some accelerometer data, which uh, that's going to be the, uh, the raw flight accelerometer data from the RV separation. So let's go to vibration data, if I can type correctly. So this week we're up to 6.2 and rising. And we have a new function here called shock saturation removal. So let's go to this. So this is the shock response spectrum for a single degree of freedom system subjected to base excitation with saturation removal. 
and that's saturation removal again is via this indirect uh, mean high pass filtering. So let's, and it has to be an acceleration time, history time, and acceleration. So we're going to call up our raw data, our raw pyrotechnic data. Uh, English units, Q is equal to 10. Apply saturation removal, yes. Now typically we go from 10, or excuse me, 100 to 10,000 hertz for our pyrotechnic shock uh, specifications, where we're deriving a spec from measured data, I should say. But I'm going to start at 10 hertz, because that's going to help demonstrate better what's going on with the saturation removal. So we're going to go ahead and calculate this, and we have our raw data in figure 1. And figure 2 is our SRS of that raw data. Well, you've seen this before in the hard copy. And here we've clicked on, excuse me, here we've clicked on apply saturation removal, yes. But actually, that process hasn't started yet. We have to, let's just set up for our intermediate step. So here we have our, our two curves diverging. And we want to come up with a plausible estimate of what the actual event was in these lower and mid-range frequencies. So we go over to this middle column here where we have some options. And the desired slope. Now, this is just sort of kind of a, 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 a loose goal. And, and the initial slope we expect to be somewhere between 6 to 12 dB for both curves. So I'm just going to uh, split the difference and say 9 dB per octave is our desired slope. And what, what actually we're going to be doing here is we're going to be varying two parameters, the maximum number of passes and the maximum window size. And the maximum number of passes just means how many times are we going to filter the signal. And, and for what we're doing, probably you know, one is, is, is good enough and, and, is, and is, in fact, the best choice. The window size, that's the, the size, size of that um, sliding window. And I'm going to say 400 is going to be our maximum size. That's just sort of a default parameter. You can change these however you like for your data. <clears throat> so what we're going to do, actually, is uh, do, do mean filtering for, mac for, for windows up to maximum si size of 400. And we want to determine what the best outcome SRS is going to be. And we've got several criteria for for judging what the best outcome is going to be. And, and that's going to obviously, uh, we're, in other words, out of all these candidate filtering cases, we're going to pick the best one, which best meets our criteria. And that includes having initial positive and negative slopes of, in this case, uh, as close to 9 dB per octave as we can get. We, we certainly expect the two curves, positive and negative, uh, to, to be reasonably similar to one another across all the natural frequencies. And, and the software has already figured out for this case, based on its own criteria, that uh, 640 hertz is a, is a key frequency. And we're going to say above 640 hertz, we want our, our resulting SRS to be the same as the SRS of the raw data. So, so, so that's another uh, criteria. So, so we've got a couple of criteria set up. And we're just going to go ahead and punch the calculate button and it's it's not actually going to do 400 cases for window size because uh, the window size has to be odd so it's just going to be it's going to just go through about 200 or so cases and it's going it's going to go through that mean filtering process where it low pass filters the data for each candidate and then subtracts the low pass filtered signal from the raw data to get an indirect high pass filtered signal then taking the SRS of each of those candidates, and then evaluating per the criteria I just explained. So let's go ahead and, and click Calculate. And this is actually going to go very quick, because OK. So in this case here, we have a whole bunch of plots that we're going to have to look at for our cleaned up data. And I need to be I'm going to be careful how I show these to you. 
Okay, I've got three time histories across the top. This first one is our raw time history. The second is a saturation estimate time history. So through that mean filtering and going through all those candidates, this is what the software estimates that the saturation was. So we're assuming that this is the per portion that is spurious or is bogus. Well, one of the things that we've run up against is in our, our well-meaning desire to remove the bad data, we're probably also removing a little bit of the good data as well. And that's just something we have to acknowledge. It's just a practical limitation. Um, but, but this shock event, here it goes up to about plus or minus 5,000 Gs. And this is going from 50 to about minus 250 Gs. So we're, we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the good portion of the signal in order to uh, take out some of the bad part of the signal, or, or as much of the bad part of the, of the signal as we can. So on the right, we have the cleaned up signal. So, so basically what we've done, is we, we started with figure one, this curve. We've subtracted the curve in figure three, and that gives us the cleaned up signal in figure four. And this is our best estimate of the plausible true event. Now, one thing that happens, and this happens just really regardless of what trend removal or filtering we use, is that when we do this, we tend to get a little bit of distortion in the pre-shock. And we can, we can, we can somewhat uh, mitigate that by just taking a smaller portion uh, of, of pre-shock. We need to have a little pre-shock there, but just, just taking the minimum uh, pre-shock that we can, we, can, we can get away with. And th there's actually some trade-offs, so we're, we're not trying to just come up right against the initial peak. We, we, do, we do need for some practical uh, reasons to have a little bit of pre-shock. So, but anyways, we're going to say, okay, that little pre-shock distortion we can live with. Okay, now I'm going to show you the corresponding velocity to our cleaned up signal. And that ski slope effect is gone. The, the, shock, the, the velocity shock is oscillating somewhat symmetrically about at zero baseline, as is the case for our cleaned up accelerometer data. Uh, you can see that the pre-shock distortion effect uh, becomes a little more amplified in the velocity time history. And there's sort of some low frequency things going on here. Now, th there is some uncertainty about this. It depends a lot on how we uh, process that data. Um, but this, this is probably just about as good an estimate of the source velocity as, as we could get. It's re re reasonably, reason reasonably so. Uh, the other thing I want to show you here is how our SRS plots came out. So on the left, we have the SRS of the raw data, which we've already talked about. On, on the right, we have the SRS of our cleaned up data. Now in this case, well, a couple things to note. Above, let's just pick 800 hertz. Above 800 hertz, if you just sort of take your eyes from one curve to, to the next, it looks like those are uh, pretty similar. Not, not exact, but for engineering purposes, the positive and negative as we go from one plot to the next are, 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 pretty, are pretty reasonably close. And, and that's good because we do not want our saturation removal to affect the known good portion of the shock. Now, on this cleaned up data here, we, we have a slope, and it's, it's, it, our desire was 9 dB per octave, and we, we may have somewhere around 7 or 8 dB per octave, and that's okay. And the positive and negative curves, while, while not exact, uh, they're certainly better than what we have on the left. So, we, 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 we have more, we have, uh, how, how should we say this? For, for the purpose of plausibility, we have some measure of confidence <laughs> in our cleaned up data. It, it's certainly plausible for what that, uh, what that source shock is in that near field on that flight vehicle. Now, some people might say that, oh, below 800 hertz, we should discard the signal and say, below 800 hertz, we just don't know, and, we're, and we don't want to show anything that's bogus. <clears throat> 
Well, th there's, there's, th that's actually a very good argument. But we, we may have a need to come up with a specification, maybe a component test spec or just a characterization of the source shock that does go, does go down to 100 hertz. So within our best engineering judgment, uh, this is what we come up with for what, what certainly is plausible. And, and, and again, it's, it's important to, whatever we do, let's document, let's document whatever we did. And let's show plots before and after in our, in our test report. And, and that's fair and that's honest. And, and really, that's the best we can do. Uh, well, the best we could do would be uh, to prevent uh, this error in the, in, in, in the first place. But after, after the fact, that's the best we can do. And there are actually some uh, vendors that make accelerometer nowadays that have built-in uh, mechanical low-pass filters and or built-in uh, electrical uh, low-pass filters uh, that, that help mitigate both the potential for aliasing and mitigate the potential for the accelerometer uh, crystal natural frequency to be excited. And if we can use those accelerometers, and, and, and I have used some, and I'm, I'm not going to be a spokesman uh, or salesman for any of the vendors or companies or even mention model numbers, but uh, you can look those up yourselves. Or if you are playing a test and you want my input for, for sensors, you can uh, c contact me uh, separately via, via email. Uh, but, but if we use, use those type of sensors, and one, one comes to mind that uh, actually has a mechanical, or it has a, a rubber, well, it is a mechanical low-pass filter via a rubber O-ring. So there's this little tiny rubber O-ring uh, that protects the crystal from, from the outer case. And that actually provides uh, some isolation. And, and the isolated frequency, I think, is close to about uh, uh, 10 kilohertz. And, 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 and I've used those. And they tend to work fairly well um, to mitigate these sorts of effects. But no, no matter what sensor you use, there's always the possibility that the sensor might break or the sensor might have some something spurious might happen uh, to it. And, 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 and as great as those little O-rings are inside that uh, one vendor's accelerometers, there's, you know, anytime we're dealing with something like that, there's a possibility of uh, uh, excessive relative displacement or bottoming out or, or other things that can happen. And so some people would, would use a, a piezo-resistive or strange gauge accelerometer instead. But uh, th those are fragile and can have uh, some problems of their own. Okay, so uh, I think we're just going to close out here looking at a couple of plots that I've already uh, described to you. So there's our, our cleaned up acceleration time history where we've allowed just a, a slight amount of uh, pre-shock distortion. And the cleaned up SRS. And our, our mostly plausible velocity time history. Okay, uh, that concludes this unit. And again, I'd just like to say, I said it before one more time, that there really is no one right way of doing this trend removal. There, there are certainly other uh, methods that we could have used. And, uh, and some of those other methods also have a uh, merit of their own. Um, and everything, by the way, everything we've done in class today, or this webinar today, I'd like you to go back and do on your own. But let's go back to vibration data. Here's another choice we could have done. We could have taken our time history, and we could have gone to the uh, filter various option. And if we go to this option here, you see, well, there's Butterworth filter, Bessel filter, and mean filter. Well, we've covered Butterworth filter in a previous webinar unit. And we've also talked briefly about Bessel filter. And the mean filtering uh, technique is something that uh, we discussed today, but it's implemented in this shock saturation removal function. Well, we could have gone to our Butterworth filter, uh, called in our data, and our, our raw accelerometer data, and we could have high-pass filtered that. Now, uh, choosing that high-pass filtering frequency is a matter of engineering judgment. Uh, it could have been 50 hertz or 80 hertz or maybe somewhere. And we could have calculated that high-pass filter data via the six-order Butterworth filter. We could have then 
save that output array into MATLAB for our high pass filtered via six order Butterworth. And then we could have gone to the shock response spectrum function and calculated the SRS of our high pass filter data. That, that's another way. Um, my own preference is to use this uh, indirect uh, mean filter method that we used in, in our shock saturation removal uh, routine there. But, you know, your mileage may vary. <laughs> and, and again, I, I look at a piece of shock data as each acceleration time history is unique. <laughs> And, and, and I'll go in and even if I have 100 channels, I'll, 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 I'll provide TLC to them on a one-by-one -one basis. Now, in, in many cases, it, it could be something simple, just a slight baseline shift that can be easily uh, corrected via a mean removal. Uh, but, but in some cases, particularly as we get into the near-field shock measurements, we're more prone to get these type of uh, saturation effects and... Uh, and effects that are more pronounced. But anyways, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this webinar unit, and uh, please contact me if you have any questions. And uh, next, next time when we get together, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, synthesizing time histories to satisfy shock response spectrum. You can see what we're going to do next week, wavelet synthesis and damp sign synthesis. So. Have a good evening. Thank you and goodbye.